In this lecture, we will study the concept of transient response. A transient response is the response of a system to a change from an equilibrium position to another, or from an equilibrium position to a steady state. This mainly occurs after two conditions. The first condition happens just after switching on the system, that means at the time of application of an input signal to a system. The second condition occurs just after any abnormal condition. Abnormal conditions may include sudden changes in the load, short circuits, etc. Past the transient response, the system will reach a steady state. A steady state occurs after the system becomes settled and starts working normally. Both transient and steady state response of a control system are functions of the input signal. We reviewed the steady state response in lecture 7, and in this lecture we are going to see the transient response. There are many applications of transient response analysis. Consider this levitation train. The levitation control system of the train must ensure that the train does not touch the guide. How can one design a controller that reacts as fast as possible with no overshoot? In other words, how would the controller gains affect the transient of the system when the levitation system is first turned on or when a passenger steps on the train? Here is another example. The point and control system of a space telescope is designed to achieve an accuracy of 0.01 minute of arc. How can you limit the steady state error while avoiding transient oscillations? As we know from lecture 7, when an input signal is given to the system, the system will have a transient and a steady state response. We have split this problem into two and addressed the steady state error in the last lecture. In this lecture, we are going to focus on the transient response. That is, the time the system takes to go from an equilibrium position to another steady state condition. Let's start our analysis with a simple first order system. Consider the one shown here. The plant is modeled as 1 over tau times s. The controller is simply a gain k and you have a unit feedback loop. The transfer function of the closed loop system y over r is simply 1 divided by tau over k times s plus 1. k is the controller gain. This is up to the designer to choose. In order to now properly choose a value for k, we need to look at both the transient and the steady state response. How does k influence the transient and the steady state response? To analyze the performance of the system, we need to specify standard input signals. These standard test signals are the same ones we used in lecture 7 for steady state analysis. The impulse function, the step function, the ramp and the parabolic function. Starting with step inputs, as we saw before, they represent constant outputs and thus are useful in determining the ability of the control system to position itself with respect to a stationary target. An antenna position control is a good example of a system that can be tested for accuracy using step inputs. Another example is an electric circuit that is turned on. Once the electric circuit is turned on, a step voltage is applied to it. The voltage remains at a constant value as time tends to infinity. Ramp inputs represent inputs with a linearly increasing amplitude, such as position on input with a constant velocity. These waveforms can be used to test a system's ability to follow a linearly increasing input or to track a constant moving target. For example, the position control of a car that attracts the position of another car that has a constant velocity would receive a ramp input as the desired position. Parabola inputs, whose second derivative is a constant, represent constant acceleration inputs and can be used to represent accelerating targets such as a missile. And the last one, which is the first here, is the impulse function. An impulse function is most often used in order to induce an initial condition in the system. Let's consider a mass spring system. If the input to this system is a displacement x, a step input would be a constant displacement of the mass, that is, we stretch the spring and hold it as time, ten, as time tends to infinity. An impulse function would be equivalent to slapping the mass, that is, providing a lot of energy at a small amount of time in order to induce an initial condition. If, for instance, the mass starts at a position x0 and, uh, and is let go from there, that will be modeled through an impulse function. The impulse function represents a amount of energy that is applied at a given point in time in order to induce these initial conditions. Here we have the mathematical representation of all these input functions. If the magnitude of the input function is a, then an impulse function in the frequency domain is simply a. A step function would be a over s, ramp function a over s squared, and a parabolic function a over s to the power of 3. Now that we have defined the standard test signals, we can see how a system responds to these test signals and then evaluate both the transient and the steady state response. Back to the first order system we defined, let's consider its response to a step input. 
If the magnitude of the step is 1, then R of S is 1 over S. We can now take the transfer function we defined, multiply that by the input, and that will give the output. After partial fraction decomposition, we can find the inverse Laplace of y of s that gives y of t here. It's a waveform that only has exponential components. If now the input is a ramp input, then r of t equals to t, and r of s is 1 over s squared. We can now replace r of t with 1 over s squared, multiply the transfer function by that input, and take the inverse Laplace of y of s to find y of t. Because both of the systems are first-order systems, the poles are only real numbers, and therefore the waveforms that we get are simply exponential waveforms, as expected. We see that here both time responses will depend on the control gain k and on the system parameter tau. k is up to the designer to choose. Let's see the influence of k in the time response, starting with the step response that we see here. As you can see from the equation we got, as time tends to infinity, the exponential term disappears and the system will settle to 1. The system goes from 0 to 1 following an exponential waveform. The higher k in this equation, the faster the exponential decays, and thus the faster the system reaches a steady state, as you can see in the graph on the left. We see a similar trend in the second one. The higher k, the faster the exponential decays to 0, and the faster the system reaches a steady state. However, there is this term tau over k that will remain in a steady state, which means that a k also affects the steady state error. If you plot this function, this is what we get. We see that the higher k, the closer the final curve is to the desired input, that is r of t equals to t. And this difference here, the distance between these two lines, is the steady state error. So the higher k, the smaller the steady state error. Where is the transient? The transient shows here is the time the system takes to go from an equilibrium that is in this case zero to the steady state condition. We can see in this graph that the higher k, the smaller the transient response. So the higher k, the faster the system reaches a steady state. In conclusion, in a first order system, we can conclude that the higher k, the faster the system reaches a steady state. And for this particular case, k affects this term, which happens to be the time constant of the system. The higher k, the lower the time constant, the faster the system reacts. And same goes for the ramp input. We can also see that in this particular case of the ramp input, the higher k, the smaller the steady state error. Whereas in the first case, the steady state error is always zero, regardless of the value of k. Another thing that we can observe here is the system is always stable. It always reaches a steady state value. So if that is the case, what is the maximum control gain k? Theoretically, there is no maximum limit for k. In practice, however, there is. Imagine, for example, that a k determines the force that it needs to be applied to a mass spring damper system. In reality, that force is limited by the maximum force an actuator can deliver. So if a k becomes too high, the required force will be very high if the actuator cannot deliver that force the system is saturated. In an electrical system, k could determine the voltage to be applied to a given robot arm. Motors in robot arms typically operate in a range of 24 to 48 volts. So if the value of k is too high, and the controller determines that a voltage of 1000 volts needs to be applied to the robot arm, because of the physical limitation of the driver, that voltage will be limited to 24 volts and the system will saturate. Even though there are no theoretical limits for the maximum value of the control gain k, one always needs to consider the physical limitations of the system. And that's what in practice limits the maximum value of k. In order to characterize a first order system response, we're going to reconsider the idea of time constant. If you write a first order system in the form of 1 over s tau plus 1, we know that a tau is the time constant of the system. This time constant represents how fast the system reacts to changes in the input. For an impulse response, r of s equals to 1. And for an initial condition, y0, the inverse Laplace of y of s, that is the impulse response, the system will be y0, the initial condition, times an exponential of negative t over tau. And if you plot this curve, we see the result here. The system starts at y0 and the case is slowly to 0. If you now set t equals to tau, exponential of negative 1 will be around 0 0.37. So when t equals to tau, t equals to the time constant, the system will be at 37% of the initial value y0, 0 0.37 y0. 
we can now formally define the time constant as the time the system takes to reach 0.37 of its initial value when subjected to an impulse input. We see it here. The higher the time response, the more time the system takes to decay to zero, the more it takes to reach the 0.37% of the initial value. And the smaller the time response, the faster it reacts. Now let's consider a step input. For the step input, r of s is 1 over s. We can now take the inverse Laplace of 1 over s times 1 over s tau plus 1, and you get the same equation you had before. We see that the exponential depends on tau. If we now set t equals to tau, we are left with 1 minus exponential of negative 1, which is 0 0.63. If we now plot this equation, this is what we get. The system starts at 0 when time equals to 0, and as time tends to infinity, it this term tends to 0 and you are left with 1. The exponential now decays at a rate that it depends on 1 over tau. When t equals to tau, then y of t is 0 0.73. We can now formally define the time constant as the time a first order system takes to reach 63% of its final value when subjected to a step input. The smaller k, the faster the system responds, the faster it reaches 0.73% of its final value. Now let's complicate things a little bit and look at a second order systems. Consider now the following second order control system. We have the same unit feedback loop, the control gain is a proportional gain k, and the plant is now 1 over s times s plus a. We can find now the transfer function y over r by simply eliminating the feedback loop. And this is the answer, k over s squared plus s times a plus k. We can write the above equation in the standard formulation of a second order system, omega n squared divided by s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. Now we can match the coefficients of the denominator, omega n squared equals to k, omega n equals to square root of k, and 2 zeta omega n equals to a, which means that zeta is a over 2 square root of k. Now both the natural frequency omega n and zeta, the damping ratio, are functions of k. k will now influence the location of the poles and the transient response of the system. We remember that the damping ratio will determine how the system responds to inputs. If you respond following exponential, sinusoidal, or a combination of exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. Now by changing k, we can completely change the transient response. How does k influence the response of the system? The natural frequency depends on k, the damping ratio depends on k, the control gain. And this is very critical. The damping ratio depends on k. So for a certain range of k, zeta can be greater than 1, which means that the time response will be exponential. For another range of k, zeta can be comprised between 0 and 1, which means that the system now we have exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. It goes from an overdamped to underdamped. If zeta happens to be zero for a given value of k, the system can be marginally stable. And if zeta becomes negative, then the system is unstable. And all this can be now changed through the value of k. Let's consider the underdamped system first. If the system is overdamped, zeta is between zero and one. Only and only when zeta is between zero and one, the poles of the transfer function are complex conjugate numbers. If you now take the inverse Laplace transform, we'll see an on wave form that will fall in this category here. We see a steady state value here, and you see the exponentially decaying sinusoidal waveform. The exponential component and the sinusoidal component depend on zeta and omega n. They both depend on k. Now let's give this system some values of for k and see what happens. When k is 0 0.25, the damping ratio is 1. The system is critically damped. The poles of this transfer function are equal real numbers. The poles are placed here, and because they are real numbers, the transient will follow an exponential waveform. When k equals to 1, the damping ratio is 0 0.5. Now the system is underdamped. When the system is underdamped, we have complex conjugate poles. Here they are. This will give rise to an exponentially decaying sinusoidal waveform as in equation 1. So now the system goes from overdamped to underdamped and you see some oscillations before it settles. If you keep increasing k, now for k equals to 5, the damping ratio decreases even further. So the poles will approach the imaginary axis and you see more and more oscillations. And these poles will continue to move towards the imaginary axis as k is increased. And this is what is happening here. For the same system, let's keep increasing k. And you see that for very large numbers of k, 1000 and 5000, 
the system now shows a lot of oscillations before it settles. And notice that the more oscillations, the more time the system takes to settle. Now let's compare the transient responses we got. We can go from any of these ones, which are relatively acceptable time responses, to these ones here that oscillate quite a lot before they settle at a given value. Clearly, in many applications, this sort of time responses are not suitable. This can destroy a system even before it reaches a steady state. So as engineers, we cannot look at this and say that one is be better than the other without an objective way to evaluate performance. We now need to define some measures of performance to evaluate the response of a second order system. Now let's define these measures of performance for second order systems. Here we have a standard underdamped response that means that zeta is between 0 and 1 and is only valid for zeta between 0 and 1. The standard measures of performance will give an indication of how the system responds to inputs, in this case a step input. The first measure of performance is the rise time. The rise time t tr is the time the system takes to first cross the value of the desired input, in this case 1. The peak time tp is the time the system takes to reach its maximum value, in this case here tp is there. Another measure of performance is the value of the peak itself. You're going to call here MPT. Another very important measure of performance is the settling time, TS. If the final value is 1, we can now define a range of 2% around it that is 1 plus 0 0.02 and 1 minus 0 0.02. Once the time response is within these two values and is stay within two, th those two values, the system has now passed the settling time. In this particular example, we see that after crossing this point here, the line of 1.02, the system stays within 2% of the final value. And that characterizes the settling time, TS. And finally, perhaps the most important measure of performance, along with the settling time, is the percent overshoot, PO. The percent overshoot characterizes how much the system ex exceeds the final value before it reaches its steady state. The rise time and peak time characterize the swiftness of the response, how aggressive the controller is, whereas the percent overshoot and the settling time characterizes the closeness of the response to the input. Now let's see how these measures of performance can be calculated. Let's start with the percent overshoot. For a unit step input, the percent overshoot is simply a way to quantify how much the system exceeds its final value, FV, before it settles. If the peak value is MPT, we can now take this difference here, MPT minus FV, normalize that by the final value, multiply this by 100 and you get the percent overshoot. If for instance the final value is 1 and the peak value is 1.2, the percent overshoot would be 20%. To find the percent overshoot, now we need to find MPT. How do we find the maximum or minimum of a function? Take the function, take its derivative, which is the slope, and set the slope to zero. Find the value of t that makes the slope zero, and now evaluate f of t at that value. This gives the maximum or minimum of that function. The function we are dealing with is this function here. It's the time response of an underdamped system. We'll take the derivative of dy over dt, set that to zero, find the time t equals t1 that makes the slope of the, the function zero, evaluate y at t1, and this gives the maximum value, the peak value mpt. Now this would be a lot of work, so I'm going to skip the math. By differentiating equation one and setting it to zero, it yields the peak time as this equation here. It's a function of the natural frequency and the damping ratio. If you now evaluate the same equation at tp, the maximum value of the function, or the peak value in this case, simplifies to equation 4. This is very simple calculus, we can skip that for now. We now have an expression for the maximum value of an underdamped system. This can now be replaced in equation 2, and for a unit step input the final value will be 1, and equation 2 simplifies to 5. The percent overshoot is simply 100 times the exponential of negative zeta times pi divided by square root of 1 minus zeta squared. This is an interesting result. The percent overshoot depends on the damping ratio. And the percent overshoot will decrease with the damping ratio. If the damping ratio tends to 1, the percent overshoot will tend to 0. Now notice that because this was derived from equation 1, this is only valid when zeta is between 0 and 1. This is only valid for underdamped systems.
What is the percent overshoot if zeta is greater than 1? 0. Because that characterizes a overdamped system. Expression 5 is only valid when zeta is between 0 and 1. The, in the first exercise that will follow, we are going to calculate the percent overshoot using this derivation here. We are going to find the inverse Laplace transform of a time response, take the derivative and find the maximum value of the function and evaluate the percent overshoot that way. That is just meant to clarify has, how this process works. But in the other exercises, all we need to know is the formula for the percent overshoot that is derived through this process. Now let's look at the settling time. For a unit step input and for zeta between 0 and 1, that is a underdamped system, this is the time response, same equation we used for the percent overshoot. We can see here three main parts of this expression. The final value, the sinusoidal component, the exponential component, and a scaling factor. In these three components, the role of the exponential component is to make this entire term decay. So when this term is 0, the system is in a steady state. When this term here is 0 0.02, times the final value, which is 1, then the system is within the range specified for the settling time, that is 2% of the final value. We can now say that because the exponential factor is what makes that decay to 0, the system has reached the settling time, provided that the exponential of negative sigma omega n ts is within 0 0.02. We replaced t with ts, the settling time. If you solve for this equation, take the log on both sides, this expression simplifies to 0 omega nts is approximately 4. Therefore, the settling time can be defined as 4 over zeta omega n. And if you call 1 over zeta omega n tau, that is the time constant of a second order system, we can say that the settling time is equal to 4 times the time constant. There is another interesting observation in the settling time. If you go back to our characteristic equation, this is a second order polynomial. If you set this to zero and find the roots of this polynomial, these are the poles of the transfer function. We see that the settling time is 4 over zeta omega n. Notice that a zeta omega n corresponds to the real part of the poles. Therefore, we can conclude that the settling time is inversely proportional to the real part of the poles. And this has very important implications. If you now plot the location of the poles, we can look at the real part, zeta omega n, and the farther they are from the imaginary axis, the faster the system is. The settling time is inversely proportional to the real part of the poles. Consider the function h of s equals to 5 over s squared plus s plus 5. In the standard form, we have omega n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta omega n, s plus omega n squared. Omega n squared equals to 5, omega n is a square root of 5, to zeta omega n equals to 1, so zeta is 1 over 2 square root of 5. The time constant, tau, is 1 over zeta omega n, that is 1 over, 1 over 2 zeta, 2 square root of 5 times omega n 5, square root of 5, tau equals to 2 seconds. Now let's plot h of t the inverse of h of s, this is what we get. The time constant is 2 seconds, which means that the settling time should be about 4 times that, that is 8 seconds. From 0 to 2, this is 1 times tau, 1 time constant. From 0 to 4, this is 2 tau. From 0 to 6, 3 tau. And from 0 to 8, 4 tau. As time increases, the curve is settling around 1 and around 8 seconds, we can say that the system reaches 2% of the final value. This is precisely 4 times tau. The settling time is around 4 times the time constant. To conclude, let's go back to this plot here. And let's consider the simple feedback loop where we have a gain k and a second order transfer function h of s. For a certain value of k, the poles can lie on the real axis. And when they do, y of t will be an exponential waveform. If k is increased, these poles will come together and eventually become 1. When they become 1, the system that was overdamped now becomes critically damped. Because the poles are still real, we'll still have an exponential waveform as the output.
If you now keep increasing k, these poles will break away from the real axis and become complex conjugate numbers. When this happens, we are now dealing with a system that has both exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. By increasing k even more, the poles will now start to move towards the imaginary axis, and you see that the oscillations will start to increase. The system here is said to be underdamped. If you continue to increase k, the poles will further travel closer to the imaginary axis. And on a point when they reach the imaginary axis and are purely imaginary numbers, there is no more exponential waveform, only sinusoidal components, and the system will oscillate. This is a marginally stable system. In this case, the damping ratio is zero. In this case here, the damping ratio is between zero and one. And in the exponential case, the, expo the damping ratio is greater than one. For some systems, if you keep increasing k, the damping ratio may become negative or some of the poles will now travel to the right side of the S-plane. They will have positive real parts. And now the system that was otherwise stable becomes unstable and instead of converging will diverge to infinity. In summary, when designing a controller, we need to be aware that by changing the control gain, we are completely changed the way a system responds. In some applications, it is desirable to avoid oscillations and to choose a overdamped system over a underdamped system. The, under, the overdamped system will typically be slower. In other applications, where speed is a concern, if the system needs to react fast, one may allow for some oscillations to occur. We have now full control of the transient response of a system, and you have also full control of the steady state error. The steady state error, as we saw, decreases as k increases, but now oscillations will also increase. So this is one design trade-off that we have to deal with. In our example, we are changing the location of the poles by varying the control gain k. We can also say that we are placing poles on this S-plane by changing the value of k. When you place a pole, we are specifying two things. We are specifying omega n, the natural frequency, and you are specifying the damping ratio zeta. We are specifying, in other words, zeta omega n, the real part of the pole. That means here we are specifying the settling time. By looking at where the pole is located on the S-plane, we can tell how fast the system responds. By placing a pole and now looking at the damping ratio, this determines how much percent overshoot the system has. We see that the percent overshoot is only a function of the damping ratio. In summary, when you place a pole, we are specifying the entire time response of the system, how fast it reacts, how much overshoot we shall see in the time response. The whole point in control system design it's, it's to now choose the proper location of the poles that will maintain a stability and meet some design requirements. Now it's time to do some exercises. They will be posted in separate videos. Thank you.